this is the only existing picture of the American Embassy, or it's a chancery building, in Santa Isabel. It was taken in 1971. Uh, and I, my understanding is it was torn down, but I haven't gone to check. Uh, the murder at the embassy in Equatorial Guinea was on August 30th, 1971. It was actually in the Chancery Building that an American was killed by another American. Can I have the next picture, please? Okay. We have three things I want to cover in this talk. First, the legend. Second, terror and mourning. And third, the case of first impression. I'll explain what that is. May I have the next? Good. This is Carl Bloser. Uh, I'm afraid he is no longer with us. He came to Equatorial Guinea to inoculate the population against smallpox and measles. When anybody survived the violence, it is due to Carl Bloser. Because when people starve, if they are not inoculated, they'll die of measles first. So Carl did a great thing for the people, even though they suffered a great deal. Uh, he provided me with a lot of information, and unfortunately, everybody in this picture is dead or was murdered. Uh, and I'm sure Carl's very happy that we bring this up. Okay, this is Clarence. This is a great woodcut I found. Uh, they sold it to a museum, by the way, and for $50, they'll clean it up for me. But I'm allowed to use it here. This is the peaceful port of Clarence. Equatorial Guinea had a real future then. It was uh, uh, an anti-slaving port. The Fernanditos were all sorts of people who were captured as slaves and freed brought to this port by uh, British naval ships, and uh, they, they have done so much for the, 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 the peacefulness of this place. Uh, next, okay. This is Santa Isabel, circa 1970. A very peaceful place, and a place before oil, a place where there is a great deal of prosperity. And I, uh, I mourn Santa Isabel, it is no more. But it, it is important for all of us to remember that it was a place with its own culture and its own people who had a future. They had a future in 1969. The next one. This is Louis Hoffacker. Louis Hoffacker was the first ambassador to Equatorial Guinea. Now, he was also ambassador to Cameroon in Yaoundé. The way it worked at that time, President Kennedy wanted an ambassadorship and an embassy in every single country, every one. He particularly was uh, interested in Africa, and Hoffacker had a lot of background. He was appointed to Cameroon, but Equatorial Guinea was very small. So ultimately, they purchased the, uh, rather they leased the embassy uh, that we saw. It's not an embassy, actually. It's called a chancery building. Why? That's because the embassy has to have an ambassador. So uh, Hoffacker was in Cameroon in Yaoundé, and he needed somebody in Equatorial Guinea. Now, the way the system works is uh, a deputy chief of mission, or DCM, is your number two guy. Now, in a place like Equatorial Guinea, where there is no ambassador, you have to have a DCM with a special title, Charge d'Affaires, which simply means in charge of affairs. The Charge is an important spot, an important post, because he takes the place of the ambassador. He's standing in for the ambassador. He has a good relationship with the ambassador or should have a good relationship. Louis is a tragic figure. He's a very brave man, I will say that. 
He did a lot of things. He was actually in Katanga when there was the Congo crisis. He stood up when very few people would. And he was a, a World War II veteran who was wounded in Iwo Jima fighting Japan. It was so bad that when he was carried out, there were only nine men left in his unit. So he's a brave man, but he also was a flawed man. He was very sad about this. He married, he had two daughters, and I am convinced that his wife found out that Louis was a homosexual when Louis was in Cameroon. The marriage was breaking up. Uh, the wife put on a brave front, but that was it. So Louis was not just a brave man and an intelligent man, but he was very sad. At this period, to be a homosexual was not a good thing in the State Department. It is also, it should be remembered, it should be remembered that up until 1968, when it was time for the budget, that means money, funding, to go to the State Department, there was always one question asked first. And the first question was always, how many homosexuals did you fire this year? As a result, anyone who was a homosexual kept quiet about it. In American English, he, he stayed in the closet. Louis was married, and he stayed in the closet. You have the next picture, please. This is a picture of a tea party, and the man in the glasses smiling behind the woman is Alfred Erdos. Alfred Erdos is the murderer we have heard so much about. I thank the lady in the picture who gave me this picture. It's a, a good picture. You can see Alfred Erdos is a tall man. He's heavy set. He always was portly. There's a good word for it. He was always portly, best way to describe him. Erdos was very different than Hoffacker. Erdos was interested in European integration. Why? He liked protocol. He liked setting tables, table settings. He liked international conferences. That's what he was going to do. Indeed, he could help us arrange this. That's what he wanted to do. And he wanted to do it in Europe. Louis, his friend, was always interested in Africa. He loved Africa. And uh, he ultimately got the job to Yaoundi and Santa Isabel because he loved Africa and he was so good at it. He saw Erdos socially. Erdos was a homosexual as well. I would like to leave it at that, you can imagine. Erdos ultimately got married too. He got married to someone who was divorced already and working at the State Department. Through my interviews, I discovered that after he threw a wild party, he went to, uh, he went to Niamey. At Niamey, he got a phone call, went to a bar and tore up the bar. Then suddenly, he went home to Washington. Then he came back married. He came back married, OK? His wife was pregnant. If you look at the birth date of his son and the marriage date, you can imagine what happened during that wild party. Uh, Erdos hid that he was a homosexual as well. Erdos was also known for doing nothing. Wherever he was posted, to Conakry, to Niamey, he would go to his office, close the door, and stay there all day. Then he'd open the door and go home. When he went home, he closed the door and spoke with no one. People liked him in the State Department in terms of, uh, well, homosexuals stayed together in the State Department. Many of our leadership at this time was gay. 
Now, I'm using that term, I hope we, I'm using a modern term, was a homosexual. We had a number of homosexuals in the State Department. They stuck together. Eridos also was also trapped at one point by the KGB. The KGB was the Soviet spy agency. They took some pictures of him. You can imagine what those pictures were. And uh, Eridos appears to have bugged a number of our facilities. May I have the next picture? This is the victim. This is Donald Leahy. This picture was taken three months before he died. He is in front of the embassy, I'm calling it that, the embassy in Santa Isabel. There are two doors there which will come into play later. Donald was what they called an FSSO, Foreign Service Staff Officer. That does not exist now. But at the time, this was the person who did the paperwork in the embassies. He was a hardworking fellow. There's a lot of good things to say about Donald. He was quiet. He wasn't a leader. He wasn't a fighter. But he did his job. Unlike his boss, Erdos, if he was asked to do something, he would do it. He was sent to many places to work. And he ultimately married a, an Ecuadorian national, Rosita. Uh, when the FSSOs, as a position, was to be eliminated, they were given a choice. Your job is no more. We have two choices. You can be a civil servant, or you could be a foreign service officer, just like Erdos. Well, Leahy chose to be a Foreign Service officer. He was going to do something called consular work. Consular work is when they stamp your visas, etc. He was happy to do it. He had always wanted to do it. There was just one condition. They had to send him somewhere. He was married to Rosita. He spoke Spanish fluently. So he said, I will go anywhere just as long as they speak Spanish there. So out of the goodness of their hearts, the State Department sent him to Santa Isabel. Leahy did not know what was there. He did not know the violence. He did not know the real problems. Nor did he know that not only did Erdos not work, Erdos also could turn violent. We have cases of him turning violent in Niamey. We have cases of him turning violent in Conakry. This was all pushed aside. I will leave it at that. May I have the next picture, please? Donald Leahy was killed uh, in August, uh, on August 30th, 1971. I must emphasize how violent it was in Santa Isabel. There may have only been 15,000 people there at the time. That is our own estimates. And if you made a wrong move, you'd be dead. In the words of Al Williams, who preceded Erdos, if you made the wrong move, you were dog meat. It got worse. The Spanish were kicked out. That's another story. There was a pogrom declared against the Portuguese. Pogrom means anything's legal. You can steal everything they have. You can kill them. It would be legal. Al Williams' wife almost got killed. I spoke to her. She went to the beauty parlor not knowing that Matthias had declared a pogrom. When she walked out, it was next to a... Uh, liquor store. The Junotad broke into it, came out with liquor, saw her, and were going to kill her. The only thing that saved her was her beautician. The beautician ran out and said, no, no, she's an American. Don't kill her. So they didn't kill her. 
That was life in Equatorial Guinea. It is important to know, if you had a relative who died, you could not mourn. <coughs> you could not mourn. If they killed your father, your son, you could not mourn. You could not show, you could not, not show any sadness. There's many parts of this history, <coughs> sorry. There's many parts you don't know. People were dragged out of their house and cut to pieces. Al Williams himself almost died. They chopped people up and left them in the street. This was bad. And, you could, and furthermore, Christianity was being eliminated. Priests were, were made to walk over hot coals in their bare feet. First the Protestants, then Rome. Matthias ordered that before there was a service at a cathedral like this, you had to say, Matthias is the unique miracle. To me, that's declaring yourself God. When Donald Leahy was killed, Rosita was beside herself. Donald lived here. He was steps away from this church. And he was well liked. Donald could speak Spanish well. He worked with the local population. He was as open with the people as Erdos was closed to the people. Except some. Erdos, uh, it is important to know, I think, that Erdos when he first arrived, went to a general store and asked where he could buy homosexual services. Messias had a secret police. Do you really think that Messias didn't know within an hour that this is what he was getting into? He knew. The police watched everybody, including good old uh, Carl Bloser. When Donald died, his wife, Rosita, insisted on having a, I'm sorry, on having, on having a service here. This is an important historical point for uh, St. Isabel and for Equatorial Guinea. Why? Everybody came. Everybody. It wasn't just the people who knew, knew D Donald. This was a chance to mourn, and I think that's important. Your father, your family, sorry, everybody died. And if you mourned, you'd be dead too. But here, you could, you could do that. Rosita actually found a priest who had not been killed or ran away. So you actually had a priest. You had a Roman Catholic service, and everybody came. Ah, when they got Erdos back, America had to deal with him. Now, this is what's important to America. Uh, there was never any doubt that Erdos had murdered Donald Leahy. The problem is we had to get him back. And the problem is something called venue. Now, venue is where they try you. Whatever you do, if you kill somebody, if you rob a bank, there is a venue. And that's where the court can be. Well, what if you kill someone at an embassy? In the end, Erdos got a really good lawyer. And at the very end, he was obviously guilty. And the lawyer stepped up and said, well, thank you, Your Honor, but he can't be guilty. This court is not a legitimate court because Donald Leahy died in Santa Isabel in the embassy. If he's in an embassy, it doesn't belong to any state. It doesn't, and he can't be tried in Equatorial Guinea. Indeed, in the State Department, the joke at the time was, well, if Eridus wanted to kill him, why didn't he kill him in the front yard? Then the Equatorial Guinean courts would, would get him. 
So the question that the, uh, the judge, Judge Lewis, asked was, do you mean to tell me murder is not illegal? And here's where, where it comes in for America. Can I have the next one? Okay. There was, a, I, I love this, this really is a 1978 picture of uh, Lagi. Uh, the question is, what if, you, what, what if you kill somebody on a plane? There actually was a 1950 case. And this was the case that they went by when they brought Erdos back. Uh, Judge Kennedy of 1950 had a case where somebody in the Caribbean tried to kill somebody. They got into a plane in Puerto Rico. The plane flew to uh, New York City. <laughs> and the killer jumped the man on the plane. Well, where will you try him? Where were you? Were you over Puerto Rico? Were you over Florida? Were you over South Carolina? Well, a decision had to be made. Where do you get tried? And the decision was New York. So the Americans made sure that Erdos would be served papers when he landed in Dulles Airport. Dulles Airport is for the Washington, D.C. area. We had an additional problem, by the way, because there was a storm and the plane was blown off course to Boston. The plane landed in Boston and the State Department did everything it could to make sure nobody got on the plane. There was a marshal there ready to serve him. And because of this issue about the plane, they wanted to make sure that Erdo stayed in his seat. Well, he was served. Go to the next one. And then the law kicks in. Well, okay, if he's murdered in an embassy, what law do we have? What if you're killed on a ship? Okay, most of our laws for being killed on a ship are military laws. You have sailors. What if one naval sailor kills another one? Well, that's military law. But what if a civilian kills a civilian on a ship? Well, we had some uh, discussion, and then we had other questions as well. Could I have the next one? Okay. My favorite, actually, I should say that my favorite is, what if you kill someone on a pile of guano? We had a case before the courts in the 70s. Somebody killed somebody on a pile of guano in the water. Believe it or not, I've looked into this, and there are a lot of big islands that are just made of guano. Is guano land? We had two cases, one in Maryland, one in Florida. Uh, that guano was there for 30,000 years, but somebody killed somebody on a pile of guano. This is my favorite. This is an iceberg. What if somebody kills somebody on an iceberg? T3, that's the name of this iceberg. The iceberg was between Canada and Greenland. What if you kill somebody there? Well, we went to Canada. Canada said, no, that's ice. We went to the Danes. They have Greenland. They said, no, 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 no. They're Americans. You try them. And this case was a very important case. And in the end, the United States made a decision and the decision was, if you kill somebody on this ice, or you kill somebody in an embassy, you will be tried wherever the United States decides to try you. Okay. Now, that went on appeal. Why? Because it's new law. In American justice, you have to have an appeal. And in the end, this was forgotten until 1998. American embassies were attacked in Kenya and Tanzania. And someone named Osama bin Laden directed the attacks, and we had to try him. We went back to Equatorial Guinea. The law said uh, we, could, we could decide where to try him. If Osama bin Laden attacks an American embassy, they're attacking American territory. Therefore, he cannot be tried in Africa, he cannot be tried in Kenya or Nairobi or anywhere, Tanzania, and we decide to try him in New York City, in Brooklyn, it's part of New York City. After that, 
every single terrorist case in America is tried in Brooklyn. Why? Because of the murder in Santa Isabel, because of the decision. And the United States has stayed that way. Uh, and that's called a case of first impression. Now, just to give you the legal bit, uh, uh, no one had been killed in an embassy before, so that's why we had to go through all of this. And that's why it's called a case of first impression. It's why, um, it's why there are terrorists being tried in, uh, in Brooklyn to this day. I hope my American accent wasn't too much for you all, and I'm sorry if I get choked up. I have some awful things I know about uh, Macias and uh, murder, and uh, I hope I've been helpful. Thank you. Eh, bueno, después de esta eh, trágica pero compleja y apasionante historia, eh, que bueno, sobre la que luego volveremos, eh, especialmente digamos, no solo la historia en Guinea Ecuatorial, sino el precedente legal realmente eh, 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 curioso de que la, el asesinato en una embajada de Guinea Ecuatorial sea el precedente legal para el juicio de los terroristas sí. eh, posteriormente… Eh, eh, supongo que, que podremos acceder al libro en el que esto lo yes. tratas más extensamente eh, y bueno, procuraremos de difundirlo en el, en el CEA porque me parece realmente la, la, las implicaciones eh, de por uno y otro lado que, que, que esto tiene eh, en cuando se habla luego ahora del de el combate de la civilización occidental contra el terrorismo ah. Eh, que se inaugura como un asesinato de un norteamericano a otro en la embajada de un país que oficialmente es el símbolo del terrorismo. Pero bueno, en el coloquio saldrá esto. Le cedo la palabra a Gonzalo.